Robbie Bent, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks, Howie. Super grateful to be here and get to know you a little better. Yeah, likewise. So we're going to be talking about breathing and breath work today. And I'd like to begin by just telling, having you tell folks about who you are and a little bit about your journey. Absolutely. So I started um, my career early trying to like really make money, be successful. And that led to making a ton of poor choices going into finance and then trying to build a startup just to make money and, you know, raising venture funding and the startup failed. And, you know, really quickly to glance, breeze through that as I was 28, uh, struggling with addiction, living in my parents' basement, feeling really defeated. It was sort of uh, one of the first kind of turning points in my life where everything that was important to me was kind of taken away. I had to, you know, move out of my apartment and sell my car and sell my things. And I, you know, completely broke. And it kind of sent me on this path uh, to, to figure out how to change. And mm -hmm. so that path included 10 day Vipassana meditation retreats, moving to Israel, getting introduced to psychedelic medicines, um, specifically ayahuasca, uh, which then led on this, you know, six year sobriety journey. And as part of that journey, I wanted to teach people about modalities that could help them become happy, help them make behavioral change. I started with psychedelic medicines and, and meditation and really struggled to get friends into either of those. One is illegal and the systems to use them are not quite in place yet. And we can get into that. And the second meditation is just takes uh, a lot of effort. The feedback loop is quite long as well. And so I saw a lot of my friends struggling to implement either. It's like, oh man, I really, you know, really want to create something that's going to help people feel better. Uh, because it worked for me. And, you know, after I had that ayahuasca journey, I joined the Ethereum Foundation, moved to San Francisco, I all of a sudden felt successful for the first time and credit that to, you know, meditation, psychedelic medicines and, and breath work. And so the really interesting thing with breath work or why I was so uh, excited about it was because it was just more accessible. And so the type of styles we practice combined really amazing electronic music and famous musicians and it's kind of like listening to your favorite set on you know soundcloud or spotify but then with breathing tracks overlaid and so you just kind of you know take 10 minutes 15 minutes 30 minutes three minutes to have a little break for yourself to listen to great music and you can change your state and when we started experimenting with breath work realized like wow this is like having a painkiller an antidepressant a psychedelic medicine in your pocket a coffee in your pocket that you can use at any time uh, just through physiological changes of breathing. So that was a bit of background on, really short background on a lot of different topics that I've, I've been in, involved with, but kind of that's why I'm passionate is I think there's a technique here that can help people um, master their own mental health and create behavioral change. Mm, I love it. And um, what, what occurs to me is maybe kind of a, a step below and talk about like what why do we need anything in order to be mentally healthy and change behavior like that seems to be a, a fairly uniquely human issue like what what's 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 your sort of ideology i don't even think it's uniquely human i think it's suited to our environment and our time and so things have drastically changed uh, only in the last 20 years even based on how we evolved and so you think of the average day now right you're predominantly sedentary in a temperature controlled environment access and over access to as much food as possible generally of a lower health quality uh, lack of exercise and movement compared to ancestors and then you know that's all like well known however um, cell phones have made things go parabolic and so what I mean by that is 20 years ago 50 years ago 100 years ago boredom was natural so if you're listening like when was the last time you were bored if I put you down at a restaurant and you're waiting for someone, you'll check your phone five, 10, 20 times, you know, being in that bored state no longer happens. And in that bored state we're in, there's two branches of the nervous system. One is fight or flight and one is rest and digest the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And just to make it simple, one is pushing the gas pedal. One is pushing the brake. And when we wake up, check our phone, there's a Slack notification, an email, you know, you're late for work, you're looking at social media, those create dopamine and norepinephrine responses. Your brain doesn't know the difference between real stress and perceived stress, so immediately you're, you're stimulated. 
And what happens is we're in that stimulated state all day long, which is great for like focus and work, but it disconnects us from the part of our nervous system where we find meaning, love, you know, we're in that rest and digest when we have sex, when we do eye gazing with a partner, when we give someone a hug, when we're eating. And so that part of our life is really under assault due to our environment. And it's extremely difficult for, for 99% of people, you know, they're on their phone, there's requirements of real life. And so where 20 years ago, you're in a natural meditative state because you're, you're bored, you're sitting around doing nothing, even the way you watch TV, there would at least be commercials, you know, now it's just nonstop <laughs> all the time. And so if you're listening and just think like, do I feel overwhelmed? The answer, you know, whether it's mental health or not, it's just the answer to do I feel overwhelmed for everybody is yes. <laughs> and so now we need these new tools uh, to help re-regulate and change our, our nervous system state. Beautifully summarized. Um, guess what, what, what occurs to me is, you know, the, do these, couldn't we just say, let's just stop doing those things? <laughs> or do we need the tools in order to, like, you know, not be addicted to the cell phone? I think you need sort of an equal balance to the thing you're doing. And, and so the tools that we use, ice baths, saunas, breath work, you know, exercise. In my personal uh, experience, I use psychedelic medicines also. And so these things help change the nervous system state physiologically, which people can get behind. So if you've, you know, go for a run, like you feel it instantly. If you do breath work, you feel it instantly. You can instantly feel better. And sometimes just stopping, you know, those thoughts are there persistent. And so many people listening, it's probably I wake up, but you know, I need to go to work. What about my task list? What about my kids? What does this person think of me? It's just never ending. Mm. So it's very difficult without specific techniques that help you get into your body and stop the thinking mind and just give you some space from like, the overwhelm is yes, checking your phone, but then it's the thoughts that are created in your mind. Your, your mind is like a wild animal, you know, it's just thinking all the time. And so it's very difficult to say like, okay, I'm just going to stop looking at my, my phone, right? For most people, that's almost impossible. Uh, especially, this isn't really a topic that's covered in society. There's a ton of research on, you know, increased phone, increased social media use with uh, higher rates of depression, but it's not something that's like well known, right? So if I'm saying to you, stop using your phone half the day, you know, try to create more space. It's it's like extremely challenging. And I just saw even trying to teach people to meditate, you know, take a couple minutes, very low conversions. Many people would say, oh, I'm, I'm busy, you know. So it's, it's just this problem of people don't understand the way they're feeling oftentimes, but but know they feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if meditation is harder now than it was 20 years ago. For example, because, you know, it's like, um, you know, stepping off of the escalator the faster the escalator was going, the more you're going to stumble and the harder it is to just walk on the ground. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I would I would bet significantly harder to go from this tweaked up fight or flight, coffee, work, computer, phone state into a state of, OK, I'm, I don't have any stimulation. And, and you can notice this based on how busy you are. The addiction uh, increases in like size and scope. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if you're consistently on email all day, when you stop, there's this period of I want to do something. Hmm. I want to check Twitter, I want to watch TV, it's it becomes your brain is producing so much dopamine. This is this is how it works with addiction to, to drugs. And, you know, that response starts to take over everything in your life where you need continued stimulation. And so this can be, you know, it can be binging on Netflix, it can be eating fast food on Uber Eats, it can be social media. And so the more you give into these uh, reward dopamine producing activities, the harder it is to stabilize and move to the other side of, of the, the nervous system to put the, the brake on. So I've seen that in my own life also in like really busy times, I get super overwhelmed. And so that's when some of these more body based activities like the ice bath, the sauna breath work can be extremely helpful. Uh huh. Okay, so um, I do um, ice buckets or cold showers, um, ice baths, ra rarely, mostly after a tournament when I feel my body just needs to go cryo for a little while. Um, help us understand how like what is that doing 
vis-a-vis vis -vis the nervous system that can have an impact on sort of the speed of my, my life and the levels of stimulation. So number one, the ice bath from a longevity standpoint, um, there's a famous longevity researcher, David Sinclair, and he ranks hot and cold contrast therapy as the second best thing you can do for your health and longevity after intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating. So there's a ton of longevity benefits which are great and, and I'll get into, but when you get in the ice bath, what I think is really interesting from a nervous system standpoint, you're boosting the norepinephrine in the brain by three times. And so that's what's norepinephrine. It's a little neurotransmitter that creates feelings of mood, attention, vigilance. So, you know, you get in the super cold water, your mind's saying, hey, this could be dangerous. And as a result, you become hyper aware. And so what mm -hmm. that means is, you know, your worries, your thinking mind, it just flows away. And so what we found from doing these for thousands of people was that this is actually a gateway into a meditative state. And so if you've struggled to meditate, you sort of, you know, are forced in a way to just let go and become hyper present. And then about 30 seconds in, we teach you to control your breathing and control your nervous system response. So in real life, when you face fear, anger, anxiety, embarrassment, these create physical effects in the body that create this fight or flight state. And you can't really train for that, right? Once you're angry, you're angry. And so what we're teaching you through daily ice bath exposure is to feel what it's like for your nervous system to ramp up using long, slow breaths, breathing deep into the belly, into the parasympathetic nervous system, slowing the exhale down. You're able to take that heightened state and reduce it in real time. And so what happens when you've been practicing this for a while is you notice when you're feeling those emotions in your day-to-day -day life. So somebody cuts you off on the road, you know, you start to get angry. You feel, hey, my nervous system's been activated. Okay, I know what this feels like. I know how to breathe through it to move back into the other side, the rest and digest part of the nervous system. So it's, it's very rarely talked about with ice baths, the mental benefits, but you're in this sort of guided meditation state with like training wheels. It's helping you get to that state of focus. And then you're learning how to relax through your breath uh, to change your nervous system state. So it's just like a mind blowing experience for creating resilience for difficult emotions, which I think is just so special because it, it works every time. You never build uh, habituation to it. It's, I've been doing it for four years, five years every day. And it's, it's just every single time when I need space from a challenging emotion, it's, it's there for me. Right. So it's so true. You, you never habituate, but that's also like in the negative sense, I'd be like, is there kind of come a day when I'm not going to try to talk myself out of it? And so far, it hasn't happened. It's like every day I hear my voice. I say, well, you know, like, you know, so I'll either do like a, you know, five gallon ice bucket, which is, I don't know, 40 pounds or something. I'll say, Did I tweak my back? I think I tweaked my back. I just, it's just not responsible to do it today. Or, yeah, no, I think, you know, I don't think like blah, 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 blah. blah. And it's always BS, but I've never I've never got, you know, like you do something for that long. I've been doing this since 2016 and I still have to fight myself every day to do cold exposure. Like, <laughs> is that part of it? Yeah, so it, it never that first step of like, you know, it's similar to jumping off a bridge or out of a plane like you have that fight or flight response and it's it's nerve wracking and, mm -hmm. and so what we start to teach people is to turn that feeling off instantly so you can control the, the nervous system through breath which is really important and empowering but there's always that like gentle resistance and so what we found works really well is having a physical space dedicated to this and so you know in our space there's a 50 person sauna with crazy sound system there's four ice baths there's guides that are helping you get through it there's a team around during the classes to hold you accountable and, and you know once you do it you feel amazing and so what we found for people is once they you know have five six seven under the belt they start to crave the feeling after mm. despite having that like bit of fear before and so it's really important to tie you know and the difference in a, in a cold shower or an ice bucket versus an ice bath is pretty significant and the norepinephrine release and that feeling of just like absolute feeling of being alive and so we start to teach people like, hey, this is the feeling of being alive, like completely alert in this hyper aware state. Uh, notice it. Right. And then after people have done that five, six times, they start to the, the fear is reduced because they know about the carrot on the other side, how good they're going to feel and how good it is for them. So we, we have those 
guided experiences in community. Plus we explain the science at a, at a very detailed level, what's happening in the cellular system in terms of like reduced inflammation, boosted immune system, boosted antioxidant systems that increase metabolism. And so uh, when you explain all this, you start to understand, okay, this is like extremely good for me. There's science backing it. It's a slight like five second, 10 second discomfort for this amazing reward. Mm. Uh, we found that people can like really get behind that. Gotcha. So, um, you know, I'm a health coach. I get people to do all sorts of things and they will agree. Yes, I will do some breath work. Yes, I will do some meditation. Yes, I'll journal. I have not gotten a single person to agree to do cold exposure <laughs> and they laugh. And like, you know, the, the reaction, like I've, I've kind of given up, like I'll mention, like to me, the, the the daily cold exposure is the single most important thing that I have done to regulate my nervous system better than meditate, like all the other things, you know, are around the edges or benefit. And but like the cold exposure was like night and day in terms of my ability to withstand discomfort and stay human and stay present. And I can't get anyone to do it. Do so like if you're, if we're, you know, someone who's not going to come to your center with with all the support, how does you know, how do you help people like do do their first ice bath? Absolutely. We have content around this. And so we, we've had 5000 people come through our space, people that are, you know, 70 years old, people that are 14 years old, you know, both sexes, all races, people that are like deathly afraid of the cold and hate it. So it's very, very possible to get anyone to do this. And what we do is we start by talking about the science. So we'll spend five minutes explaining really detailed what a boost in norepinephrine means, how that reduces inflammation. People that live to 100 have two things in common, low inflammation scores and strong immune systems. The cold significantly impacts both of those uh, elements. There's an increase in your antioxidant systems, as I mentioned. Your antioxidant systems basically determine how healthy you are, how uh, able your body is to reduce free radicals caused from like stress, and toxins, environment. So we kind of really like dive into, okay, why should you do this, right? And make sure people understand, like there's been studies that people have doubled the amount of white blood cells when swimming in the winter. Mm. That's crazy, especially for people who are like, hey, I'm worried about COVID and, you know, boosting my immune system is extremely important. So linking to science, sharing podcasts where they go deep into this stuff, it's like step one, baseline table stakes. You need to understand the why. And most people don't. It's like, oh, I saw Wim Hof. He jumps in the cold. He's crazy. Ha. Huh? Like, uh -huh. you know, it's like, okay, there, there's real research here that this is significant. The second point is explaining, like, how do you do this? What do you do? Right. And so we'll do Zoom calls where we'll do a cold shower Zoom challenge where everyone jumps on. They have their phone. They're putting it in their bathroom. And we talk through the science. And then we explain, like, okay, how do you actually do it? So a cold shower, you know, you start warm, wash yourself regularly. It doesn't need to be difficult. Then you turn the cold water uh, all the way to cold, you know, cold right away. Just just get into it. And you really need to explain the first five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. It's not going to feel like that the entire time, right? So it's, it's kind of like make sure you're getting in there, getting your neck under and breathing. And so we'll guide people in the call through the breathing. And so this can all be done uh, via Zoom. So I think the combination of really falling into the why and then explaining the how, like, yeah, this is going to be a bit uncomfortable. And then we usually like to get people to try it two to three times. And then after, which is the most important part, is like, how do you feel now? OK, so you so you're kind of guiding people through that the first showers. Um, do you then go back and forth? So if you talk about, you know, uh, David Sinclair's he, you know, contrast. Would you recommend to people to, you know, two minutes cold, two minutes hot, back and forth in the shower, or just get out cold? No, I think it's just a matter of how long your body is cold for and creating this norepinephrine effect. Uh -huh. And so, the longer your body is cold for, the better. I don't think there's, you know, if you're doing contrast and you're getting more time cold, great. But it's definitely not necessary. I think it's just part of a you know, a routine. If you're trying to get started, just aim for 30 seconds cold at the end. Try that for five days. It's much better that you find a pace that you're going to actually do and continue versus you do one five minute cold shower and then never want to do it again because you're afraid. So yeah. I think it's just getting used to that sensation of cold that takes 
you know, 30 seconds mastering that and then increasing as, as you need. Uh, and so both with the hot and cold, you know, with the hot, with the sauna, it's the benefits come from your body overheating. So it's not really in short dose so much as, mm-hmm. you know, your total time accumulated. So I don't think the contrast is super necessary in the shower. Gotcha. All right. Now, how about um, cold baths? So when I've done a cold bath, I typically go and buy a bag of ice, um, which can, you know, if I do that every day, sounds like it could get expensive and I need like an extra freezer. So how do, how do you help people? What, is that, what does that look like for, for someone? Yeah, so our goal is to build spaces in every city that people locally can come to just like they would a, a gym and access uh, cold and hot, um, you know, the same way they would as a fitness class. So I think for people who are listening, The options, uh, like buying ice, huge pain in the ass, plus super expensive. So I would say your options are uh, a chest freezer, which you can rework. And there's tons of stuff online about like do-it-yourself chest freezer. The cost is 200 to sort of $400. You can plug it in. There's some, you know, stuff around is it safe or not because it's connected to electricity. And there hasn't been any um, injuries that I know of. But a lot of people will say, hey, you know, be careful. And so we have many people in our community who sort of, you know, have a garage or outdoor space and they put the chest freezer and it can be installed in, you know, a weekend. Very, very easy. Next option is... uh, And the chest freezer, then you keep water in it? Yeah, exactly. And so you would keep water in it and then filter it every every once in a while. If you're using it solo, you know, daily, you don't need to worry too much. Maybe once a month you're replacing the water. Once every three weeks you can kind of tell when the water gets murky. Uh You can also use like something like chlorine, uh or like a shock product like you would with a pool. But I would say, you know, it's, it's pretty good for usually around three weeks with a single person, like 50, even even longer, like probably 40 to 50 people is when we notice like the water needs to be changed. Gotcha. And and do you have to do you have to um, get a special device to keep the temperature above freezing if it's a freezer? No, you can generally put salt in the water, but it, the water itself won't uh, freeze over. So there, there's a ton of... Um, guides you can just click on you can easily you know plug in put the water in and there's like uh, thermometers you can attach that you can control with your phone that are like twenty dollars okay great okay um and can we talk about saunas for a couple minutes because i I would love for you to convince me to get a sauna because i've sort of like uh you know flirt with the idea every so often but then it's kind of like expensive and where am i going to put it um, like, so, you know, what's the science? Sell, sell me on that. So you want to be using the sauna. The, you know, uh, recommended protocol is, is sort of three times or more per week for about 20 minutes at around like 180 to 190 degrees, sort of baseline. And so they did this study in Finland. It's the largest study done on sauna use over a 20 year period. Uh, primarily in men, only in men, uh, 2,000 men. And over that 20-year period, they found men who used the sauna three times or more per week had a 40% reduction in uh, cardiovascular disease, 50% reduction in all-cause mortality, 60% reduction in, in Alzheimer's. So these are like, you know, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in North America, especially for people with poor diet so it's like one of the only ways you can work your vascular system and what's happening you're due to heat your blood vessels are dilating it's reducing strain on the heart it makes it easier to pump blood flow through the body so like fantastic it's also what's called an exercise mimetic so it's your heart rate gets up to 140 to 160 so it's very similar to a brisk walk or light jog so on days when you're recovering it's fantastic for the body Uh, at very high temperatures you know as you're pushing yourself your brain produces heat shock proteins So heat shock proteins help disaggregate plaques from the body, which may be why the Alzheimer's cases were Mm. so much lower. Um, It also produces BDNF, brain-derived neutrophic growth factor, which is fantastic for neuroplasticity. So from a brain health standpoint, super beneficial. There's also uh, the effect on your mood. So there was a study in the 80s on sauna use where they would put people in an infrared box and a light box without heat. And controlling for that study, they found better results than any antidepressant medications. And so what's happening, your brain produces um, endorphins, right? And and so when your endorphins obviously make you happy, they make you feel good, they're stimulating. And so in the sauna, you're actually producing dynorphin when you overheat, which is like the feel bad hormone. 
And what it prepares is for when you get out of the sauna, a massive increase in endorphins. So you, you feel like, wow, I feel amazing. And that feeling lasts for the rest of the day. So you have this local mood boost every day, fantastic for brain health, amazing for uh, cardiovascular health, and then finally for detoxification. So sweating, just like an exercise, you're removing heavy metals, leads, phthalates, plastics, mercury uh, from the body, which we're all overexposed to due to current environment. So again, just like David Sinclair says, you know, contrast therapy, hot, cold, from a health coach standpoint, from a longevity standpoint, this is one of the best things you can do for your body outside of fasting. So, you know, for me, I'm in the sauna minimum four times a week. It's my favorite place to be. I'm doing breath work in there. I'm reading in there. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm just connecting with friends. If you have one at your house, you can invite friends over and make it, you know, sort of a dinner date. There's just, it's just such a profound, and it's been around since the beginning of time in all cultures, you know? And so what does that say? Like, I really love things that humans have done through our evolutionary paths. And so, you know, the, the Temescal in Mexico, the sweat lodge in indigenous cultures, the onsen in Japan, the hammam in Turkey, the banya in Russia and Finland, bathhouse in ancient Rome. It's just been used for social gatherings, for health, for purification, for spirituality forever. So, you know, that's, that's my, yeah, my pitch for why you should uh, get a sauna and, and as having one and have had one for four years, it's just not nothing better than then. Okay. Well now, now I'm motivated. What should I get? So depending on the first thing is like how big is your space and what is the power requirements? So if you're in the U S and you're looking for, um, you know, a solid infrared sauna, the brands clear light and sunlight are both very high quality. They, the panels that they, they source are fantastic in terms of like EMF emissions. Uh, so that, that's kind of one, if you had a, and that comes, I think the cheapest one is about five grand for a two person, which just plugs into the wall. If you had budget and space, I would highly recommend a dry sauna with an electric heater. Uh, because a lot of these benefits happen at higher temperatures when the body is stressed. And so in an infrared, you may have to spend 45, 50 minutes to get to that point. Whereas in a dry sauna, it's, you know, 15, 12 minutes to get to the same point. Mm. Um, and so you really want to be pushing that heat stress, re releasing those heat shock proteins I mentioned, getting the heart rate up. That's where a lot of the value comes is from stressing the body. And so if you can, uh, a dry sauna is, is fantastic. Okay. What about um, my local gym, which I haven't gone to since COVID, has a steam room. Is there any research on that? Yes, the problem with the steam room is the more humidity in the air, the hotter the temperature on the skin. And so as a result, the total temperature is much lower. So steam can be great for the lungs, for respiration, uh, for, you know, your skin specifically for, for hydrating. But it's not the same level, not even close. It's usually like 120, 130 versus a sauna that's getting up to, you know, 190. Mm. Uh, I think it's even actually, it may, might be less than 120. And so the problem is the air, the water in the air gets so hot, it burns the skin at a certain rate. And so it's much harder to heat your core temperature in the steam room than in these other, I would even say a hot tub is actually better than uh, a steam room. Huh. All right. I've seen uh, infrared saunas for like, you know, 1,000, 1,200. Is there... Uh, which is, you know, sort of closer to a budget that I would consider. Is, are there downsides to the, the, you know, the low end? Yes, you just want to take a look at whatever panels you're buying that the EMF radiation coming from them because you're spending, you know, every day, potentially one hour in there. It's quite a lot of time over a 10 year period. And so for me, the expense to ensure that the EMFs are minimal with with I know um, clear light and uh, sunlight and panels have done. Mm hmm. So I can I can highly recommend those brands for low EMF. But if you're going to buy them, just check where did the panels come from? What's the EMF? Do a little Google search uh, for sauna rankings and, and just kind of do your own your own research. And just that's the one thing to uh, make sure. All right. So we, we've covered heat, heat and cold, um, mostly for my benefit. <laughs> but now let's let's talk about um, breathing. You said is, you know, m far more legal than than most psychedelics, more accessible um, it's a, a sort of a lower barrier to entry, at least in people's minds than meditation and gives quicker results. So what's like, how did you first encounter breath work? What was your first experience that told you there's something here? 
So the first, there's there's many styles of breathing. There's you know your your breathing habits day to day, moment to moment, and then there's specific breath work to elicit a feeling. And so you know if you think of what you can do with breath work, it's it's kind of in a triangle. One is push the gas on the nervous system to boost your energy to create that fight or flight state to create focus. Another is push the brake to get into that parasympathetic state, which is you know after work I'm having anxiety, I'm trying to relax. And the third is, is, you know, kind of exploration. And so this is in 15, 30 minute, 45 minute sessions where you're reducing the CO2 and the blood flow to the brain. And as the result, uh, you're shutting down the thinking mind and allowing for emotions to be processed. And so that you use if, you know, you're struggling, you've, you've had an issue with your job, you're having self doubt, you've got out of a tough relationship, you're struggling with your kids. It's sort of, you know, I can either boost my energy, I can relax, or I can get space and process challenging emotions, which is very beautiful. And so those are the three things when I think of like what breath work, all the different styles of breath work kind of elicit those responses physiologically. And how I got into it was through this explorer I mentioned, and it was doing Wim Hof breathing. And so I'd heard him on a podcast and thought this was really interesting and listened to a YouTube guided session he did on Lewis Howe's podcast. And I did the breathing and I was like, wow, this is it's like four years ago now, maybe. I thought this is, this is amazing, and so I did it every day. That that YouTube video for an entire year, and I would use it when I, you know, worried about my financial security. We're moving, uh, and I've got all this stuff to do. You know, is my is my job going to go well? And so, just kind of every morning, I would do this thirty minute breath work um, to boost my energy and help me get some space from from thoughts. And that's why I mentioned, you know, it's kind of like having a coffee, anti anxiety anti-inflammation or like painkiller uh, or psychedelic in your pocket because your breath can do all those things which you know I started with Wim Hof and then I did the um, read the book breath by James Nestor and and the oxygen advantage by Patrick McKeon and read almost every research paper on breathing styles breath work and how it affects the body and sort of found these three this triangle and then we, we built uh, a ton of exercises around each the interesting thing about the exercises though which you won't find anything else is like they're set to amazing music right so it's like wow i want to listen to this anyways and so maybe you're listening to your favorite classical piece while you're cooking and in the background it's just guiding you to take the proper coherent like six second breath for boosting heart rate variability while you're cooking you know or while you're walking and so the idea was can we slide breathing and these moments into your day in what's otherwise like a super busy day in a way that's that's fun. Mm. Um, yeah, so can you describe like um, the, what 30 minutes of the Wim Hof or what you, you know, maybe you've adapted it? Um, well, let me let me ask this first. Like, is there a, a minimum effective dose for breathing? Right. I have a friend who's a coach who starts every session with like 32 seconds of breathing and you know, four, four by four, uh, four second box breathing twice. And he says, like the, the people who come and work with him, like feel it in 32 seconds. And so I'm wondering, like, yeah, so let, let's yeah, let's try right now. So if everyone is listening and, you know, put a hand on your, your belly, your belly button and one on your chest and we're going to breathe in through the nose. Filling up the belly and then a long, slow exhale through the mouth as long and slow as you can. Just letting go of any tension in the body and the shoulders. And so if you notice in that, I don't know, 15 seconds, you can have a state change. One single breath deep into the lungs can change things. One single point of focus of breathing in, breathing out, letting go. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. So minimum effective dose is, is one breath, uh -huh. which is why it's so powerful. So, you know, on the app notification three times a day, hey, take your single breath, you know, or take two single breaths or take three single breaths and kind of start there and see where you can go. And so that's if you want to down regulate the nervous system, which we talked about, push the brake, get into that parasympathetic, start to relax. If you want to upregulate, we've seen in as little as, as one minute and around might be, you know, in two, out two. So just deep into the belly, not holding at the top or bottom, but just Just like that, following that pace for about a minute. And at the end of the minute, one deep breath in, fully exhaling and holding on empty for about 30 seconds. And that's the traditional Wim Hof method doing rounds. It's based on 
an even older method that's thousands of years old called TUMO. And what's happening is you're breathing out more norm carbon dioxide than normal. As a result, the blood vessels constrict and a fight or flight response happens. So blood flow goes to the brain, you become super aware and alert. And so you can boost your energy just like a coffee in a single minute, a single round of that style of breathing. And so for us in the morning, our most popular sessions are just called up, up meaning upregulate the nervous system. And it's generally around three rounds of a Wim Hof like variant. And during each round in the hold, we ask a question, you know, what are you grateful for today? What would make today great? What's a relationship you're grateful for? You know, uh, what do you want to achieve? So things like that, that you might journal on. So while you're doing the breath work in the hold, you have some time to, to contemplate. And then we have usually a little meditation, just a little visualization at the end to get your day started. So it's kind of like a morning routine in a box, ready to go. One thing you press play and you get your contemplation, your breathing, your meditation, your gratitude, your powerful feelings all in one. And we've seen that over, you know, kind of, we try to have them under 10 minutes. So kind of between six to 10 minutes each day, there's a, a new one. And we've seen that be just super popular as a way to, you know, bootstrap and start off on the right foot. Gotcha. So now the way the way I learned Wim Hof was sort of this you know, 30 breaths with a, a full energetic inhale, um, a passive exhale, just sort of like, you know, like a balloon deflating and then holding your breath for as long as you can and sort of, you know, timing it with the timer. And then when you're done breathing in and holding that for 10, 15 seconds. So it sounds like you're not doing the extended timed breath hold. No. So, so we have songs, you know, tracks with different um, levels of breath hold, depending on uh, your skill set or like where you feel comfortable. So some some songs have much longer holds. I, I don't personally find there's too much difference in the hold length. So, you know, for us, simple 30 second to 45 second to one minute hold works quite well. And if you feel you need more, you can do a longer session or, or longer rounds versus like you know, really trying to hold in, until the end. Like most of the effects are actually coming from the, the breathing itself. And what's happening, as I mentioned, you're breathing out so much carbon dioxide that your blood vessels are constricting and the amount of oxygen the brain is absorbing is actually significantly reduced, which creates all kinds of, um, you know, shutting down of the prefrontal cortex and your body's ability to uh, sort of process emotion. Mm -hmm. And so you're having that fight or flight response plus this, and so that can be done, you know, it doesn't matter how long you're, you're holding, you can do short holds, long holds, and, and just kind of, you know, uh, if you want more, then do do more rounds. Okay, gotcha. So a while back, um, I was doing some uh, Buteco, I guess is the uh, uh, Patrick McEwen's um, Oxygen Advantage is, is based on that. And so what I was doing was sort of like five or 10 minutes of breathing where I just wasn't quite breathing in as much as I wanted to. And I found it nearly unbearable. <laughs> like it was it was just incredibly hard to do to, to keep going. I couldn't wait till it was over. Um, is, do you do any, you know, is it for for the um, exploration or like, is that is that part of a protocol? And if so, what's the value? Yeah, so the Buteco is all about setting, resetting what's called your CO2 tolerance and trying not to get super technical here. Imagine your brain like a thermostat and it's measuring how much carbon dioxide is in your body, in your cells. When you've hit a certain amount of carbon dioxide buildup, it's cell, your brain is saying like, hey, breathe out. Mm. Now, why is carbon dioxide important? So you can think of when you breathe in, you're breathing in oxygen molecules. They're going through your lungs. They're going into the red blood cells. They're, they're like kind of, and this is an analogy from James Nestor, but they're kind of like little boats. And so imagine these red blood cells, these boats picking up oxygen from your lungs and taking them throughout the body to be used. Now imagine carbon dioxide is like the seatbelt. And when, you know, there's not enough carbon dioxide in the body, it's very hard. It's something called the Bohr effect. It's very hard for the oxygen molecule this little person to get out of the boat and be used in the body and oxygen is needed in like all you know uh, your brain processes your musculoskeletal, your your organs all the processes that happen in your body run on uh, oxygen and so imagine if you don't have enough carbon dioxide in the body you're not effectively absorbing oxygen even if you're breathing in as much as possible just from a you know physiological standpoint you need carbon dioxide to facilitate the delivery 
of oxygen into the body. So that's why it's important. Now, over time, your brain is measuring how much carbon dioxide is in the body and that shifts. And so if you're eating uh, acidic foods, you know, fast food from Uber Eats, if your mouth breathing, which happens when we go to bed, if we eat late before bed, if you're exercising a lot, you mouth breathe again, your body gets used to not having a lot of carbon dioxide in it because you're over breathing. So things that cause over breathing again, eating acidic foods causes you to release more carbon dioxide as your, your body's pH rebalances. Um, mouth breathing at sleep, which can be caused by alcohol, dehydration, eating before bed, uh, excessive exercise daily where you're over breathing to get in more oxygen. Um, and then just general stress. So if you find, you know, you're looking at your phone all the time, you see something, you get worried, you start breathing out of your chest, you over breathing, your mouth breathing. And so the whole idea of Buteco is your nasal breathing. You're really extenuating the holds of your breath. You're building up when you hold your breath, your body builds up carbon dioxide and you're slow. Like you mentioned, you're, it's called like the hunger for air. And you're breathing at this point where you almost feel like you're going to suffocate because you're building more CO2 in the body. And as a result, you're resetting the brain's thermostat. And so the idea is that there's a, there's a cool test for this called a CO2 tolerance test. And so you breathe in once in the morning, nice, long, slow exhale, and you hold on empty and you'll count how long you can hold for. And it's not like how long you can push. It's just when your diaphragm spasms which kind of gives you an idea. Is it 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 40 seconds? And the, the rule of thumb is if it's under 20 seconds, then your breathing patterns in life uh, need improvement. And it's likely it's under 20 for like majority of people because as I mentioned, you know, acidic foods, overstressed, uh, eating before bed, all these things are like pretty common in society. And so most people, athletes especially because they're exercising so much, actually have poor breathing habits. Mm. And so Boteco is all about correcting your baseline breathing habits and your body's ability to absorb oxygen. And so a few ways that are fantastic is taping your mouth when you sleep, uh, just so your mouth is shut. So you're guaranteed to breathe through your nose, which is kind of strange feeling at first, but it's, it's kind of the best way to get into Boteco is just, Hey, I'm going to tape my mouth. The others are mm. doing, uh, during walking, you know, we have some breath works where they're just long, slow exhales, short inhales and you can do them while you're walking you can do them sitting down but it's this like building air hunger during the day and then the, the other is you know while you're at your computer using some type of tool or device that slows your exhales naturally so you're having proper breathing patterns uh during the work day and a, a device that you can buy for like 20 bucks is the it's called the relaxator by anders olsen who's also written a book on breathwork called conscious breathing that's pretty good Okay, great. Um, so one question that I have about, I guess, the, the, the CO2 tolerance test, is that the, that's the same as the Bolt test? Yeah, okay. body oxygen level test. Right. So what I'm unclear about is when you say breathe until empty, like how, like empty, empty, like I can't, you know, there's not another exhale that I could do, like I'm caved in or just sort of. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just breathe out normally. And when you're at the bottom of the exhale, just stop there and look whether it's like it's your own personal score, right? You're not really trying to cheat. You're just trying to see like, what is my my number and mm -hmm. how can I increase it? And even if your number is 10, can you increase it to 20? If the number is 20, can you increase it to 30? Uh, elite is sort of like 40, 45. If you're in that range, then, you know, uh, great. Your breathing patterns are like pretty close to perfect. And so then a lot of this stuff like mouth taping, it's not as necessary. It's when it's below 20 that you really should start thinking about um, making changes. And, and these changes mean your body's going to absorb more oxygen at the cellular level, which means like less anxiety, better sleep, uh, all kinds of different things. And so if you're struggling to sleep, waking up in the middle of the night, oftentimes it can just be poor breathing habits. Okay, gotcha. And yeah, I just want to say, you know, a personal testimonial to the fact that like I've done work on stress on myself and I've taught about it for decades. And people think like, oh, the moment of stress is when I have leverage over it. Like I'm going to think it's not in my control or count to 10 or, you know, serenity now or whatever. And what I discovered from the breathing and the other nervous system stuff is that the game of stress is won or lost in, in practice well before you you reach that moment of you know like when you redline you're you're done 
Right. At that point, all everything goes out the window. The, the, the goal of all this neurological adaptation is to lower your baseline so that things don't don't redline you anymore. So you still have capacity to deal with them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, that's why having a daily practice of hot, cold breath work, all of these things help to deal with overwhelm, help to create space from a cellular standpoint. They help to make sure the body functions properly. Exercise is another you know, so kind of looking holistically at all these things, why I like them, like breath work I can do in five minutes, I can do in one minute, I can do on our app mm -hmm. at any time. So it's very easy to slide into my day. I can do, you know, hot and cold with friends at night, which is great because I do that instead of, you know, going out for a beer, I don't, I don't drink or, you know, going for a coffee or going for uh, a meal. Like I just love to have people come over and we sit in the sauna and it's super healthy. And so, you know, trying to get as many of these body-based practices into your schedule in a way that works for you, that's kind of all you really need. Mm -hmm. So one, one question, you made it seem a moment ago like there's dangers to over exercising, but exercise is good. Do you have any thoughts or guidelines on like, how do I know if I'm just, you know, over breathing during exercise and it's not giving me those benefits? Yeah, so generally when you are exercising, you will be over breathing when you're exerting yourself at you know a specific heart rate and you can watch when you transition from nose to mouth breathing so for professional athletes that really want to maximize their bolt score because how much oxygen they can use determines how long it is until they they gas out uh patrick mckeon will actually have them train with mouth tape and so hmm. for the first three weeks month it's like quite difficult because they can't exert themselves fully without breathing through their mouth. And over time, the body adapts and is better able to uh, optimize for oxygen. So if you're every day, uh, you know, pushing yourself to the max, you're definitely over breathing. And so the things you can do is like tape your mouth during exercise, which is kind of weird if you're not a professional athlete, but just be cognizant of like the point when you go from nose breathing to mouth breathing. And then the other thing you can do is we have some sessions around uh, post-workout breath just five minutes, you know, a couple breath holds, slowing your breathing down to let that carbon dioxide build up again and sort of um, prepare you post uh, exercise session. Got it. Great. So you've mentioned an app, you've mentioned a center. Um, what so you know, if people are like, enthralled, and they want to learn more, and they want your help and guidance, what do you, what do you have for people? Yes, I think that the app is the best place to start. So it's just othership. Um, Othership.us slash app, and so you can download on both uh, iPhone and, and Android. And there's you just said amazing other you know, Othership, O T H E R S H I P. Othership.us yeah. slash app. Yep, and we can put in a link to the the show notes uh, if you do that. But um, yeah, that's the best way to just get started. There's like ten day intros to breath work that you can just try. There's a two week free trial. Uh, just to kind of get a sense. It's like, hey, is, is, is working on my breath something for me? That's available now for, for anyone in Toronto. You know, I'd love to invite you to come by our physical space. We're already looking at spaces in the U.S. Uh, for mid next year oh, cool. in, in a few major markets. So that's really exciting, too. And then you can follow me on, on Twitter at Robbie Bent one. Uh, I talk about a lot of this stuff and you can also DM me if you have questions about like, hey, I'm trying to build a routine. What about this? And so uh, I'm available on Twitter and, and LinkedIn. And so you can put all those uh, links, but yeah, would you know suggest just jumping in, trying a free session on the app, and seeing if you know the ten minute morning specifically, mm -hmm. if that one is for you to kind of help jumpstart your day. I've just seen like you know people who wouldn't leave their house during COVID start doing breath work and release all their fear. You know, people going through breakups that was like this was all they had to kind of help them through deal with challenging emotions. So while you can definitely use it in the morning to boost your energy, and definitely use it in a time of need, like that one big breath we did on the channel uh there's deeper things you can do to really change the way you feel and like kind of inspire these feelings of gratitude and forgiveness and compassion that are so beautiful gotcha um toronto you, there's a strong russian community i know you have at least two or three you know banyas up there i, I trained at uh sistema headquarters in toronto i don't know if you're, if you're familiar with them no, not Sistema, but I've been to pretty much all the Russian bathhouses in the area. That's where I actually learned about the bathhouse prior to Wim Hof was just a, a place in Mississauga called Southwestern uh, Bathhouse. It's a traditional Russian banya, and it's uh, amazing. I spent probably been there 50 times just mm -hmm. every weekend. I would go with friends, and that's what sort of led to this idea in the first place of like 
making this more accessible uh, to all. Yeah, yeah. Now, Sistema is a, is a Russian martial art, and they're, you know, like that's where I got the the daily ice bucket and and this this idea of you know we are too comfortable in our lives and it's killing us. Um, one one more question. Just um, I know that, are there um, counter contraindications to doing certain types of breath work, either for physical or emotional, mental health challenges that someone might say, you know, I should get checked out first before I try any of this. So for the, the down regulated breathing, which is like slow breathing, box breathing, breath holds, no contraindicators, very easy on the body. You're, you're literally pushing the brake on the nervous system. So it's, it's good for all for uh, the up regulated style breathing with like longer breath holds, faster breathing where you're creating these physiological changes up. There can be contraindications for people that are pregnant. Um, but that's pretty much it. And so, you know, there can be issues for people who also have epilepsy. And then the final is when you're pushing yourself in these 30 minute, 60 minute breath works that I was talking about, which is sort of this like emotional release mm -hmm. range, uh, you are shutting down the prefrontal cortex. You are allowing emotions to come up, sometimes traumas. And so you may have a traumatic response or awakening of some type of an event. So if you had PTSD or everybody has some trauma from like fearful moments, accidents, uh, even just the time they felt fear, or, you know, rejection, failure, uh, those moments can come up. And so having support is fantastic. So we work with an integration center in Toronto, we work with coaches. And so if people have something come up when doing a deeper session, then we, uh, we, you know, recommend speaking one to one with somebody. Awesome. Is there anything that I have not asked about that you think is important for people to know? I'm super excited just to, to let people know there are new social tools to have fun that are actually healthy. So one is, you know, a, a sauna and ice bath space. It's a it's an amazing way to kind of go out and socialize. And two, what we've been doing lately is breathwork concerts. Mm -hmm. And so the concerts will have four or five live musicians. We'll have, you know, 100 people gather and they'll be split into groups. They'll do a group share to connect with the group and feel seen and heard. Then we'll have like intention setting and journaling and, you know, movement, some shaking and then amazing breath work set to music from live musicians uh, with the facilitation. And then it ends out with a close. And so what I'm trying to build or what we're, we're thinking about is you know, is the future in five years from now that for a birthday party, instead of going to a bar, an event, a nightclub, a, you know, some type of like networking thing, people meet and they do breath work together with like a live facilitator and musician. And it's, it's fun. And maybe that's the future of entertainment. And so I think for people who have struggled with meditation, cold and hot, they're just feeling overwhelmed, not healthy. That's common. That's the norm. That's 99% of people that come in. And, and so there are these new tools you can use that are like, fun and they can be used um to inspire and, and you know for me as a former addict i was just going into like church basements to share in groups and i always felt like i was broken hmm. and you know or and if you go to therapy it's like oh you're depressed like what's wrong with you and so i think there's a new way for people who've lost hope to find community in a space that's like beautiful and nourishing uh, and so i just want people to remember that one thing that like there is hope awesome awesome and uh you know and unlike psychedelics there's a there's there's no uh, you know, it's all within you already. <laughs> you don't need to worry about, um, you know, stealing someone else's culture or being led by someone who's a little sketchy. Um, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of psychedelics, and I think we're in a place where they're a very dangerous thing to get involved in if your eyes aren't very wide open. It feels like breath work is a is something that we we all have as a birthright, right? We all do it all the day, all day, all night anyway. And just to bring more consciousness to what we are capable of and what's inside us, I think can then allow us to approach these other modalities um, with more respect and more discernment. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, these, you know, these things are available, you mentioned their birthright, you breathe 25,000 times a day. And so you think of what kind of impact that has on your, your body and nervous system. It's the only trigger for the automatic nervous system that we have control of. So, you know, digestion, heart rate, immune system, inflammation, 
nervous system response. So all that's controlled through through breath, and it's available right now. Awesome. Well, Robbie Bent, thank you so much for for the work you've done for turning your own early struggles, traumas, addictions into into such a a beautiful flowering of of generosity and consciousness. And thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Beautiful. And just appreciate the, the invite. That was super fun. All right. Well, um, take care. I'll put all this stuff in the show notes. And if folks have questions, it's uh, at Robbie and that's R O B B I E bent one at Twitter. So people can hit you up if they have specific questions. Absolutely. Okay. And othership.us slash app. I'm going to go. That's the next thing I'm going to do after I get off uh, the call with you is go go find that and uh, start exploring. So thanks again.